Welcome everyone to the 30-minute Midas Touch from beautiful Dyersburg, Tennessee at the Herb Welsh Wrestleplex. Now, here is pound for pound and inch for inch, the best of the best in professional wrestling today. A wrestling genius worth his weight in gold. The Golden Boy, Greg Anthony. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 30-minute Midas Touch. I am your host, the Golden Boy, Greg Anthony. And with me, as always, is my co-host, the misogynist, Mark <laughs> Tipton. Oh, no. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. This is one moniker. I must oppose and and firmly... Uh, <laughs> Adamantly deny. I, I, I deny this categorically. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's dangerous words to be thrown around in this day and age. Uh, the misogynist word... Uh, I do understand the uh, the idea of, of the moniker this week. Uh, I do appreciate it as always. But uh, it is a, a term that could come up uh, during this edition of the 30-Minute Midas Touch podcast because uh, we're going to try to um, talk about, describe, compare, and contrast the roles and the styles of women's and men's professional wrestling. Yeah. Um, this is something that's obviously kind of in the forefront of what's going on news wise in the world right now is, you know, there's a big, you know, to do about, um, like the W the WNBA and, you know, how their salaries are, are very minuscule compared to the men's and, and things Ooh. like that. Yeah. Wow. You brought that up. Okay. I did. I okay. did. Um, and I'm of the belief that, you know, hey, if you want to make more money, then draw more people. <laughs> you know, the, the fact of the matter is they, they don't generate as much money as the NW, NBA, so, you know, they're not going to have as much money. It's just the way it works. You know, why would you pay someone $17 million when the – well, and this is something, too, I heard that um, the WNBA ha- has never turned a profit. In over 20 years, it's never turned a profit. And that's a uh, that's a huge thing to think about. So when we're talking about women's uh, women's wrestling and men's wrestling things like that, like uh, you know, a lot of people are probably not going to agree with with my stance on it. Maybe part of your stance as far as uh, some of this goes. But uh, the fact of the matter is, what we're talking about in the way uh, that I'm going to present this is uh, is factual. Okay. Um, well. I will try to handle this diplomatically. Uh, this, the subject, the comparison to the WNBA, and this has also come up in uh, soccer. The yeah. National Women's Soccer Team actually, I believe, filed suit uh, about the issue about their pay compared to the men's national team and so forth. And and where they're coming from is they're saying, "Hey, we do the same job. We play soccer, whatever. Yeah. We play basketball, whatever." But uh, that's where the business of sports comes in. That's not what generates the revenue. The performing of the job, it's the audience that comes to watch you do this. Yeah. Uh, and that's what, you know, sets the difference. It's, for instance, why a player in the CFL versus a player in the NFL. Right. Uh, in this case, no gender issues. But the audience for the CFL is nothing like the audience for the NFL. And stars in the CFL are not paid anywhere near what stars in the NFL are. And that's kind of the way I try to approach it as diplomatically as I can to explain why it is the way it is. Now, let's, I, we do want to get back more towards professional wrestling. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, you, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a prime example right there. And, like, I know a lot of – and this, the, the case that women have been trying to make in professional wrestling for the last 20 years is that they can draw just as much money as the men. That's, that's their case. Like, if given the opportunity – they could do just as well in those spots and draw just as money and as much interest as um, as anyone else. Um, I disagree with that because if, in my opinion, if if that were true, right, then all the uh, all women's companies that we've had over the last ten twenty years would have been uh, a lot more successful than they were. Yeah, and and let's be fair. Let's um, now there there are a number of promotions. I know, uh, see, Shine and Shimmer, sure. uh, among others. Yeah. Um, and I need. I don't. Uh, I know Thunder Rosa runs a promotion. I don't. I 
think it's exclusively female, but I'm not certain. I need to. I need to. I know she. I know Mission Pro Wrestling. Mm -hmm. uh, Thunder Rosa is one of my personal favorites that hopefully we'll get to discuss uh, during the course of this conversation. Um, and she runs a promotion in Texas, and I do not remember exactly if it's a strictly female promotion. It may well be, uh, but those sorts of things have been around for. Uh, some time and they've enjoyed some success but obviously starting a promotion like that is very difficult uh, and it is you know a challenge and so kudos to them to do it and some people that we've seen on television have had backgrounds where they came from those promotions up to the yeah. the na national promotions I'll say right. and so they have had some success in, in developing talent let's say yeah because there's always going to be a need you know, for women's wrestling is even though that it's a very small percentage of men that wrestle versus um, the women that wrestle, um, but also, you know, they uh, when I, my personal belief and my personal theory is that um, at any time in professional wrestling, you have about five percent of the women that are actually really, really, really good. Mm -hmm. And then the other ninety five percent are it just falls off a cliff pretty much, and it beca and it becomes a who can carry this one? She's pretty, she can do this, but right. and so but she's not. A so then we need you to lead her through. A match. We need you to lead her through this match. And now it used to be everyone understood that. Like okay, we know she's good, and she knows she's not, and she knows she has to listen to her and all that kind of stuff, so they work their matches accordingly. Nowadays, it got to the point to where um, the 95% thought they were just as good as the 5% and right. thought they could do all the same stuff that the 5% do. Right. And that's not the case at all either. So we, and that's what we've seen. We've seen a lot of guys, in my, a lot of girls, in my opinion, that don't have the skill set to do what they're trying to do but they're saying, but they're trying to act like they're part of the women's revolution, and they're helping when they're actually hurting themselves and the business by doing the way they're doing it. Right, and, and you mentioned one of the key phrases there: the women's revolution, uh, which led to the evolution. I believe is evolution pay per view. Right, uh, it really set a lot of this in motion. Um, now, this, you know, uh, this came along when the, and and I do dislike the nickname I'm about to use, but this was largely brought on by the four horsewomen, horsewomen of NXT. See, I'm stumbling to get it out of my mouth. Uh, I personally didn't like them using that name. I don't understand why, because Charlotte Flair is involved. Uh, but because there were four people that came up, namely Charlotte Flair, Becky Lynch, Sasha Banks, and Bailey. Um, and I would say those are four of the uh, better women professional wrestlers you know, going around today. Obviously, Bailey's injured at the moment, but they're four of the better. They may may or may not be the best, um, and I have a few I would put in there uh, for comparison. But they really uh, kind of brought a lot of attention to the women's division when they, as a group, came along and came to prominence. When they also, too, you know, of course, we want to say they were based off the four horsemen, but in actuality, yes. they were based off the other four horsewomen of MMA. Of, of MMA. Right. You know, and that's kind of where the, the whole thing came from. Well, we have Charlotte Flair, so. So well, we can use the term, too. Yeah, yeah. We, we can use the term, too. And that's part of WWE's brilliant marketing strategy of taking whatever they can yes. and making it their own. Yes, anything that goes anyway. And, and that's the four horsewomen of MMA, which I also did not care for, except MMA is a different thing. They were, they were MMA people who had, who admired, to some degree, professional yeah. wrestling. Um, Ronda Rousey, uh, Shayna Baszler. And I'm, yeah, Shayna Baszler is really good, too. Shayna Baszler, well, you, you may not can tell by WWE television at the moment. No. But she is. Yeah, she's she's been in some phenomenal stuff, and like even there's some women's matches, like you said, you were talking about Bailey and and um, Sasha Banks. You know that At match, Brooklyn. the Brooklyn match. Oh my goodness! Uh, yeah, that that was an amazing match. I mean, you can't take anything away from that. You know, it it made sense. They sold everything. The story was there. I mean, the drama was there. Uh, I didn't like the fact that Sasha almost died on the the reverse. The reverse, run. yes. But uh, other than that, I mean, they did a phenomenal job. But that's my that's part of my point too. Like, think about all the women's matches that have tried to do that and failed miserably, and like, that's the one like one the one percent of of. Well, yeah, that. you had a unique situation where two of the two of the very best that yeah. are going today. But that's what I understand. Together. Like, you know, 
there, there's only so much you can do now. I mean, you understand? Mm-hmm. Like, we've how many times have we seen Charlotte and Becky and Becky and Sasha and Sasha and, and uh, 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 Bailey? Bailey, yeah. Bailey, yeah. I mean, how, how many times have you seen all these girls wrestle each other? I mean, it's getting to the point now where we're coming up on a decade of them wrestling each other like that. Yes. Uh, it's one of the criticisms I have, and I, I've been kind of dancing around this, but the, I, I think they're becoming a victim of their own success and particularly in the case of Charlotte, not doing some things I would like her to do as professional, but, um, very quickly, the evolution Mm pay-per-view, uh, did you view it having that pay-per-view? Now, my recollection is that part of this was, uh, at the time the WWE had started their Saudi Arabia show. And I believe this was, it was approximately the same time of year where they were sending a crew over, but at this time, women were not being allowed to wrestle there. Yeah. And I kind of viewed this as, hey, it's an opportunity to kind of, and I'm sure the female members of the roster kind of felt slighted. It's hard not to say, hey, you can't participate in this event. Uh, so it was kind of like a make, you know, get even, you know, here's, make it fair. You know, here's something for you. Did you view it as a success in and of itself, um, as a as an idea? I, you know, a lot of times I, with that kind of stuff, I kind of think that it's as much as they want it to be paradigm shifting and you know this you know this huge thing for social equality and whatever they're trying to think. I, I really think it's just a ploy to make more money and, and sell other things. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm going to use the word it, it, to me, uh, I may get criticized for this one, but to me, it felt more like a novelty. Yeah. And I mean, let's, and let's be a hundred percent fair. Uh, women's wrestling is a novelty. I mean, the fact that there's not as many automatically makes it a novel, a, a novelty like, mm-hmm. like midgets matches. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Those are unique matches. You know what I mean? Because there's there's very few midgets in comparison to, right? You know the rest of us. Um, even though I'm relatively close. <laughs> <laughs> However, um, yeah, and that's where I think you know women are so busy right now trying to wrestle like men and do matches like the men do that they're losing the fact of what they can do as themselves as women because some of the like the unique quality about a woman in a woman's match is that uh, women are inherently more flexible than men. So they can put the, each other in these really unique and and looks painful submission holds Certainly. and and do it with ease as mm-hmm. where we can't do some of that sh- shit. I mean, we'll, sure. we I I couldn't walk for a week if someone put me in some <laughs> of this stuff. But like um and I think that they need to concentrate on that and then obviously, you know, and the thing is to if you've ever seen a bar fight, or if you've ever seen a, two women get into a fight, yeah, you know, at a bar, yeah. you know, the first thing that happens is they pull go each other, to the hair. go to their hair. Yeah. You know what I mean? And now it's almost like, oh, it's passe for women to do the hair spot where they beal them out of the corner with the hair. Ooh, and it's I'm a, argue that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But see, it's it's to me, it's that's part of women's wrestling. It's just as much a part of it as as some of the stuff we do. Right, but because they're saying, "Well, we don't, we don't want to be, we don't want to be uh, pigeon held like that anymore." Well, you're. It's not about being pigeon held. It's about getting a reaction, and that always gets a reaction. Okay. Uh, the well, we're straining, and I'll just go in and use the word. That's where uh, many of us who watched for us for some time remember the glory days of ECW when Joey Styles would scream "cat fight" at the top of his lungs. It was usually Francine and someone, um, you know, uh, Tammy Lynn Sitch, later known as Dawn Marie or someone else, uh, where the women would do that. Uh, I want to now what you're the move you're describing is what I call the hair hip toss, which is a move that I, as a fan, admittedly despise. Every time I see it, I want to turn away. Uh, I hate it. I will always hate it. There will never be a day when I think it's okay. What, uh, what about the one where they step on their hair and pull them up? I also hate it. Uh, see, those, those I, I can all... deal with it. Uh, that one, because that one, say you're a, a man with longer hair, you could say, I could see someone doing that in those matches as well. So let me, let me make a point to this, if you don't mind. Okay. So uh, in these matches where the women are doing it, is, yes. the, is the woman doing it a heel or a baby face? Generally a heel. 
generally heal, and you don't like it when they do it. Yeah, well, I need to be specific. Well, I understand what you're saying, but right. I, but my point is, she's a heel, and she did something you don't like, and that's what we we're missing anyway in wrestling. There are more than one kind of don't like <laughs> uh, for for me, and I had to be specific. Either way, it's heat, though. No. Yeah. There, there's one where I change the channel. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, that's still heat. <laughs> well, but it, one generates money and one does not. Uh, mm. And and that's my my debate here is now the scenes I'm describing in ECW were primarily managers. And so the females yeah. in that role were fine. But if we want to present a woman as a trained professional wrestler, mm-hmm. then having, then it's not unreasonable for me to say, hey, that's the thing you see in a bar fight may not translate to what you see in a professional wrestling ring with trained wrestlers where maybe that is put to the side. Whereas managers on the outside who are not necessarily trained professional wrestlers in the case of Francine, for example, Mm -hmm. I don't know that she ever had any matches, any real, you know, in ring uh, training or anything of that nature for them to do that. Okay. That was kind of part of the show. But when I, you know, let's say a Shayna Baszler, uh, when I when I see Shayna Baszler in the ring, I want to I know she's capable of really, you know, she gets a reaction. I don't like her, but it's not. Mm-hmm. I don't want to turn off the television. Don't like her, mm-hmm. uh, and that's and that's what I'm trying to get at. Why I want to keep that to a minimum in professional wrestling. I watch. Yeah, I, I disagree. Just because. Okay. <laughs> just I, I thought you would. Yeah, I mean, just because, like we said before, like if. When you're, especially when you're booking, you know, you really want um, everything you've got on your car to be a, l- a little bit different. You don't want everything to be same old, same old. And all of us makes sense in the same world, however, but you still, you still want it to be a, a smorgasbord of, oh, of, sure. of wrestling. But you want to include it. Yeah, exactly. So, like, to me, women are the only ones that can really get away with that, you know what I mean, in a, in a serious mode. You know what I mean? So, like, to me, it just works for them, and for them not to use it would be me like like me saying, like, we're never going to do Sunset Flips again because it's passe. Well, no, Sunset Flips is one of the, the greatest wrestling moves in, in history. Think how many matches have been won with a Sunset Flip over the years. Probably not a lot in the last 20 by, by a lot of standards, but throughout the history of wrestling, it's a proven commodity of, you know, uh, of um, success. Okay, uh, well, I guess the analogy I would try to draw to kind of explain my point of view is there are things you would do in the context of a standard match versus, say, a street fight. For instance, if you were putting on a street fight between men, uh, there would be less likelihood to see an Oklahoma roll or Mahi Straw Crate or whatever you want to call it or a victory roll of those sorts of things because in a street fight, you know, there are the types of things that you do in that is different than you would be in the others. Right, And so if you want to do those things with managers on the outside and all that, but when you have two women competing as competitors, train it, then I'd like to see that, if not eliminated, at least diminished to a great degree, <laughs> then my opinion. I want everybody to do it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we'll leave that one there. Okay. But I do want to say the thing you mentioned about uh, the women want to perform matches like men. Uh this came up to me, and I thought this may have been a reaction. Uh, really, in the history of women's wrestling, one of the controversial areas was the Divas area uh, era in the WWE. I would say they're the largest company. They kind of set uh, the, the expectations for a lot of people. But during the 90s, we had a great deal of the uh, mud wrestling, uh, lingerie pillow fight, et cetera, and so forth. Do you think that the women wanting to go to the extreme to have matches that are more like men and eschew all that is because of the, you know, I'm sure they saw this and said, hey, we want to get as far away from this as we possibly can. Does that seem logical to you? Kind of, sort of. But at the same time, like, they can sit there and say that, um, oh, that, you know, that makes them want to be actual wrestlers and be taken seriously and all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, they all became fans because of that. They were all fans of Trish Stratus. They were all fans of Lita. They were all fans of all those girls. You know what I mean? All the girls that were quote unquote TNA. They were just you know given five minutes in between the semi main and the main. <laughs> so a little fodder match. You know what I mean? Five minute title matches. You know shit like that. And I understand that's that's almost being set up to fail because there's no way they could right. deliver in that spot. 
But at the same time, like they got paid and they were famous and the whole whole nine. So to me, it's once again, it's it's just being it's it's being selfish to want to be more than that when you don't have to be. Does that make sense? I don't. Okay. Well, uh, you wandered into something else. I kind of uh, had a disagreement with there. Um, the you said something about that that was what made them want to be wrestlers. I would argue that not necessarily so. And here's my say. Now, yes, Lita and Trish, uh, particularly Trish, that whole she had a whole angle with Vince McMahon uh, that went on for some time where she was clearly there as arm candy, etc. But I would say just this last Monday on a Raw, it was the, they celebrated the anniversary of the the instance in which Trish and Lita had a championship match that main evented Raw. Yes, and it was I believe the first time ever, if yeah. not in many years, that they did. And the match they had certainly was very much a professional wrestling match. They yeah. they really put and I would say maybe I want to argue that you know for instance that was something they saw to mark as an anniversary. Is it possible that that type of match, that is what more drew more women to want to be professional wrestlers than the kind of, I'm going to say TNA type stuff of the diva era? I don't think so. Just because that's one match compared to the systematic, uh, system, uh, systematic you know, showing of this kind of type of thing every week for decades. You know what I mean? Like, you know, it just... You know, yes, that one match was great, but I don't think there was enough people watching that one match that created a whole generation of women wrestlers. Well, maybe watching it live, but that's a match that's lived on. Now, how many dozens of these other matches that we can describe and say, well, this one happened, and I might fumble around and remember who was actually in the thing, and went through all those types of matches that they had week after week. And yes, even, and in fact, even now I would argue, for instance, when they had the recent uh, Queen's Crown, whatever, I don't know why they didn't just call it Queen of the Ring. Yeah. I think I think the total uh, I, I saw somewhere a listing of the total time of each of the matches in the tournament leading up to the finals, and it was less than what you would expect in a standard match uh, main event match on Raw. I right. mean, it was just like they were routinely two minutes and under was the matches involved in the tournament, and it. Another, and I thought, well, how do you expect that well, to work for anyone? Another reason for that is if they if they've got less time, they have less time to make a mistake. If you understand, if you can only do eight good things, then don't give you time where you can do a hundred. Let's give you time where you can do five. You know what I mean? You see, you see that thought process? Oh yeah. Well, you're making uh, my Goldberg argument. It's why his matches generally lasted three to five minutes because, and I have a very negative view of the gentleman. That is my, you know, my my bias there um i don't think he could have he, he really couldn't have matches longer than that that's why they had his entrances be so long so they could have him on screen longer because he really did not have the experience and knowledge to have a long main event style match so that's why he was the only one who was shown coming from his dressing room all the way to the ring to have him on screen the one of the, the one <laughs> in problem, my opinion yeah one of the problems with goldberg too though was um and to me this was the main crux of what's going on is uh he did not know how to sell like that that was it's it's an art in itself we know that but like he he really had trouble selling he had trouble registering he had trouble you know all these little things that we learn and stuff like that and i guess he felt like the goldberg character or whatever it was supposed to represent sure. wasn't meant to sell like everyone else yeah. but thing is like even hulk hogan sold Sure. You know what I mean? Like Hulk Hogan, when he was getting his ass beat, he sold. If he liked his heel, you understand? Like he, he oh, sold. Oh, when he wanted to. Yeah, when he wanted to, he sold his ass off for him. So, I mean, if, if Hulk Hogan, the biggest star ever, you know, just about, you know, who's still six foot eight, 300 pounds or whatever it was at the time, you know, if he can sell, then anyone can. If Andre the Giant can sell. I saw Andre the Giant sell for the original Sheik. The original sure. Shink is like five foot five. Right. Right. But he sold like a mother for the the original Sheik. And it was believable. He, it, he I think he I think he fireballed him actually. He fireballed Andre and Andre fell to the ground, right? And Andre mm-hmm. couldn't see because he was blinded by the sure. by, by the fireball. But every time Andre would reach up to grab the top rope to try to pull himself up, the Sheik would kick him. 
Okay. Right? And he, like he couldn't. He had to go back down, sell in his gut, and go back, and he never could get up. And that was that's that's beautiful storytelling, right? Well, like keep the big man down. Yeah, exactly. If you if, get him down, keep him down. You know, he's not he's not seven foot tall when he's on his back exactly. or on his ass. So um, there's just little things like that. Okay, uh, and I do. Uh, I will try very quickly. I guess you know we. On this subject, also, we do want to recognize the NWA did recently have a women's pay-per-view. I believe it's called Empower, I believe. Often, I believe their show is called Power, so they called the, you know, so they had an exclusive women's show. I think it's Empower with three R's, though. Yeah. Empower. Well, yeah, well, and I think they do the similar thing, they on, do the same thing on, the, yeah. on the Power, NWA Power show. I don't like that show. Either, Yeah, well, that, hey, that's that's their thing. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll let that go. Um it's like the guys it, that put Z's on their names that don't, you know. Yeah, well, it's it's marketing. You're wanting to stand out. Guys. I, I understand. Uh, but part of what brought this to my mind was I know Tony Khan was recently had this subject broached, and and he was kind of hesitant about having it, and, you know, he wasn't interested in having an exclusively women's show. And then people really criticized him. But to me, it made sense because he he wants to include them in his show. And in fact, he just introduced a championship that's going a second championship that's going to be exclusively for women, the TBS uh, title, which they're having a tournament for now. Um, they have women? Do they have women's tag titles yet? Uh, they do not. Okay. Uh, and 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 in all honesty, I don't know if they have the roster depth to have it. I, I would criticize the WWE. Their women's tag team championship is. A joke. Essentially. Uh, they really don't. I mean, they tried to have it rotate between brands and still they really don't. Part of it is Vince has a long known dislike for tag team wrestling in general. Um, and I'm and, and being among the women's ranks, I'm sure it doesn't help. Uh, Which is really odd because you know who Vince's, one of Vince's favorite acts was growing up? No. The Valiant Brothers. Really? Yeah. Okay. That was because that was the first cool heels he he remember. Ah. You know what I mean? So like, um, I've heard that mentioned uh, uh, several times. So yeah, the fact that he and it is weird that he doesn't. I understand his fr- from a business aspect of the t- of the tag team thing. His aspect is okay. So if we are trying to make money on this entity, mm-hmm. right? And this entity involves two people, and one's injured, then the entity is worthless, basically, right? right? So that's why they do a lot of makeshift tag teams and just give them random names because eventually they're just going to break them up anyway and then they can do whatever. Right. But it's like basically just putting two guys together instead of actually having a tag team like the Dudleys or the Road Warriors. Right. Or, you know, Rock and Roll, Midnight, you know, stuff like that. But, well. I don't agree with it, but I'm no, just saying that's, I, the, I, I that's the thought process. I despise process. it, but they would get me get me far too off on, a, on the subject. Uh, I do want to say that, uh, you know, I'd like for those who listen to this who may want to tune in, I would point out people like, I've mentioned Thunder Rosa, and I would like to also point to Serena Deeb, who has had a number of really high-quality matches lately. Uh, I would like to, you know, if you're looking for, you know, watch for some quality women's wrestling, watch those. Now, okay, quality women's wrestling, okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Go on YouTube and search uh, AEW women's botches and you'll right. and you'll see some of the worst stuff you've ever seen in wrestling history yes in the shortest amount of time yes you know we i think we talked about that before the AEW botches are just mind-boggling of how many there are already they've only been in business a little over two years sure and it's just it's one thing after another you know so uh as much as there is like i said as much as there is great great women's wrestling out there there's there's bad stuff too and it's bad stuff at a at a high level <laughs> okay well, uh, I wonder if we could make a botch out of NXT 2.0 at this point. Because I, I would start with Braun Breaker falling on his face. <laughs> um, but that's just me. I, I'm kind of sour on that program, as you may well know, as listeners probably well know. Uh, but the things I would point out is there has been over the years. Now, we mentioned the Trish and Lita match. We mentioned the Sasha and Bailey match. Uh, I would mention the, and I mentioned this on previous, the match between Paige and Emma, the first day of the WWE Network. They had a, a match I really enjoyed on the first day the WWE Network came on the air. And so I really thought this would be a change in the way they presented women's wrestling. Then there was also the Charlotte versus Natalia. Yes. With Rick and Brett at ringside. Yes. They had a tremendous that, that match. Was, that was a, a great match, too. I mean, like I said, there's the, the possibilities there. 
I mean, there's obviously some some great quality stuff, but it's like we have to wait through so much shit sometimes to get to those things. You know what I mean? Well, and that would be one of my criticisms. I would levy at Charlotte Flair among others. And even and even you know, I, what's your favorite territory of all time? Is it Memphis? Oh goodness. Um, Sure, I suppose that's. That, I mean, that's so. <laughs> that, I mean, that's a tough one for me. Yeah, but, but even yeah. even, and that's why I'm saying, that, like, even back then, yeah, there was some bad stuff, and there were some guys that weren't that great. Sure, but everything still made sense, and everything was taken seriously, and it all ended up working out in the end, right? And that's where I have a problem with today's wrestling. Sometimes is that it's not taken seriously, and it looks bad, and it's not following any kind of storytelling slash kayfabe. <laughs> Well, this will be my question. Do you think that it is possible that in some instances that the promotions and the people running the promotions do not necessarily take this women's wrestling seriously? I I will avoid mentioning where I saw it, but I recently attended an event in which I saw a women's match that I considered incredibly atrocious. Uh, And when I saw just the way the, the match went, I was just shaking my head. I said, who sat in the back and said, hey, you, you, you know, let's do this and let's do that. And the things they did, it, I, I was on the way home. I was beating my steering wheel wondering because I was I was I found myself making up how this could have went so much better <laughs> on, because I thought, well, how could you because I became frustrated. And there are times that I think that it does not gain the attention from necessarily the leaders and the people who help you know, put these things on, they view it as a novelty to put out there, hey, it's time to put the girls out there. And so then it gets put out there without much thought or effort, and sometimes it shows in the performances. Is that possible? It's possible. At the same, at the same time, though, like, I I personally, since I've been, I've been wrestling for 21 years, and I've been part of the booking process pretty much since that entire time as well, you know. And I've had a lot of trouble out of, out of women wrestlers for years. Just attitude... Uh, money disputes, just diva-like, you know, well, sure. attitude uh, things, and it's just, it's it's really hard to deal with. So maybe that's I mean, you're, maybe you're right. Maybe they're just like, hey, just send them out there and let them do what the hell they want. Right. Because <laughs> because they're doing, we're doing it just to say we're doing it. Yeah, and then just there's no, what's the point in arguing with them, you know, or hurting their feelings or whatever. Right, because they may feel that, hey, the people are not buying tickets to watch them have a quality match. They're here to just see them be part of the show. And in some cases, it's, it's for their physical appearance. Yeah. That's a big part of it. Yeah. And they think it's, that's just a portion of the show that they want to put out there and make part of the show, but it's not something that really interests them, and they want to focus on it all to any great degree, it, right. it is my suspicion. Yeah. I mean, it's the way it is. Like I said, I, I, I'm always going to believe that, that – uh, Men's professional wrestling is superior to women's professional wrestling. Ooh. I mean, I don't know. I don't know how. Well, else. those are dangerous things to say in these times. I don't. I don't care because okay. uh, it's the truth, and I, I'm gonna. I'm gonna sit here and I'm gonna tell the truth like I always do. So, uh, to me, there's there's no there's no bones about it. There's there's just better matches. There's better psychology overall in men's matches than there are women's matches. It'd just be like if I put Kevin Durant and put him in the WNBA. You understand? He's going to score 700 points a game. <laughs> you, you know well, what I mean? Sure. There, there's, oh, yeah. Now that – and there have been uh, – I want to say in Australia, there was – they have a sport that's referred to as netball, yeah. which is some somehow similar to basketball to some degree. Yeah, it doesn't have a backboard. But yeah, – okay. Well, recently they had a tournament that was uh, – they were – they had a tournament scheduled up, but only one men's team – joined and they allowed them instead of just sending them home they allowed them to compete against the women and then that team won by outrageous scores yeah and a lot of the women were protesting about including them uh you know instead of sending them home and having them separate uh which i do understand i will quickly say for any of you that want to watch some of those matches we mentioned several matches and and i'm hoping i get to see in the tbs final uh thunder rosa versus ruby soho that that is a match I think could, has great potential, and it is still a possibility uh, coming up for the TBS championship, and it's something I, I hope I get to see. Uh, and, yes, one other thing is uh, there's a tag team match from the 80s featuring the Glamour Girls versus uh, two Japanese wrestlers <laughs> that I don't remember their names right this okay. second. But 
it is an amazing tag match altogether. Okay. Very old school, obviously, because it's in the eighties. Sure, but it's a very uh, a good indication of what women's wrestling, in my opinion, could be. Uh, it presented. It well. presented this way. Certainly. You know what I mean. So, with that being said, our time is up. For myself, the Golden Boy Greg Anthony, and my co-host, <laughs> the misogynist. Oh, you said it again. Mark Tipton, thank you, and goodbye.